Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are on this planet. Uh, welcome, Floralpreneurs. It is I, Allison Ellis, here with you live in March. I love it. March is like, I don't know, it's, it's a good month. It's like starting to become spring-ish, even though there's a ton of snow out there right now here in Vermont. Um, but I love this time of year for like continuing planning, continuing moving forward in my business. So I don't peter out in January with like, oh, I have all these great plans and then I never check back in. Like March is a great time to check back in with all the goals and the things we wanna do. Um, I'm the host of this group if you are new here. <laughs> Haven't done a lot of live streams yet this year. So welcome if you are a new member. I'm so honored that you're here. Again, I'm Allison Ellis of realflowerbusiness.com. I created this group for floral designers and aspiring floral designers, um, people of all ability levels, because I really do feel like every year should be a learning year in your business. So whether you're brand new or you've been in the business for 25 or 40 years, we have some people in this group who have been florists for 40 years, you are welcome here and you're welcome to continue learning because there is always something to learn in business, in life, and certainly in floristry, <laughs> without a doubt. So welcome new members. Hey Mandy, thanks for tuning in. Um, so today what I invited you here for is to talk about some of your pricing questions. So you guys submitted some questions to me and I'm gonna do my very best to answer as many of them as I can um, for y'all. So, but before I do that, I wanna tell you about this really special offer I have going on right now on Flower Math, I'm doing a March Madness sale. It's so mad. Um, this is like a St. Patrick's Day sale. St. Patrick's Day was always my grandmother's, like one of her favorite holidays. She always, you know, rocking the shamrock. I should have rocked a shamrock today. Um, <laughs> so that was like the catalyst for me to do this sale. So having a March Madness sale on Flower Math. So you can save until Sunday at 5 p.m. Um, and the cost is $449 for the entire course. So I'm gonna answer your pricing questions today. If you have more pricing questions, if you need an in-depth look at a step-by-step -step guide on how to do your pricing, Flower Math was made for you and it is on sale right now until uh, 5 p.m. on St. Patty's Day. Um, and I'm only making this offer for this special price to 50 floralpreneurs. So, you got to get in before 5 p.m. on Sunday, but you also want to be one of the, the 50 because I will cut it off there. Um, and if you sign up tonight before 9 p.m., you're going to get my business plan jumpstart as a bonus as well. So you'll save $150 off the list price and you'll also get this bonus. So that's what I've got going on for you today. So Michelle said in our Facebook group last week about Flower Math, she said, Flower Math is epic. <laughs> I said, she should be like doing my marketing. Um, and Gina wrote last week in the Facebook group also, Flower Math is life changing. She said that if you can't make enough money, you can't sustain this business. And that's what I say too, right? Because <laughs> you, you can be a talented florist, but you should be bringing in money, whether this is your side gig or your full-time gig, whether you work out of a basement, or an attic, or a brick and mortar shop. Um, I don't care where you work, I don't care how big or small your business is, you should be making money in your business. So that's that's what I love to help you do. Um, so this year, I asked you in the beginning of the year, like what do you most wanna learn about? And the number one thing was pricing, right? <laughs> Not surprising to me, I love talking about pricing. So. We're a match made in heaven. <laughs> if you want to learn about pricing, I love to talk about pricing. 80% um, of the florists that I surveyed last year, though, said that they are not reaching their income goals, right? So if you're not reaching your income goals, like what is stopping you? Um, you can be honest. You can leave a comment. You can just think to yourself. But like what is stopping you from reaching your income goal if you are one of the 80% Okay, so you're not alone if you're not reaching your income goal. Um, but it's important to think about like what is stopping you, okay? That is so important. Because if you're leaving money on the table, again, this flower mask sale is made for you. <laughs> it is a made exactly for you. And you do get a bonus if you sign up before 9 p.m. tonight. 
Um, so Kelly said about my course, which I love, this is like my favorite thing, that she saw an increased profit margin on the very first order she did after taking the course. And that's what it's really all about. Immediate implementation so that you can start making money right away. Um, Cause it's important that you get results, right? Um, so if you're not pricing to industry standard, right? If you're not reaching a 70% profit margin on what you spend on your flowers and supplies, now is the time to head over to realflowerbusiness.com and click on my flower math sale to get all the details because it really was made for you. But let me dive into your questions, okay? Because I really do want to dive into as many of your questions as I can. And the truth is that I understand when florists are feeling a little bit of fear or shame around money. Um, you think of this as something that, you know, you do this work because it's beautiful and because you love it and you're, you're not in it for the money, right? <laughs> But, you know, it is really important that you do make money. And I can relate to the feeling of not making enough money because my, I didn't make a lot of money when I started my business, right? I was, my money situation was kind of, kind of gloomy and dismal when I was starting out. I was in my early twenties, right? My, I had been working at this really great flower shop. It was like a nice little gig and they just suddenly closed the doors. So I was out of a job. All of a sudden, in the middle of winter, I had to get another job. So I had multiple jobs. I was not feeling super secure about, you know, like what my future was. I just knew I wanted to do floristry, knew I wanted to have my own flower business. And so I just kind of had to resign at one point to the idea, like, I'm always going to have multiple jobs. Like, I'm never going to be able to make ends meet just being my own business, right? But here we are, fast forward, and like, I am able to do that, right? You can make money in this business if you follow the right path, right? Like, I have a done-for-you system in Flower Math that shows you how to do this if you're unsure, okay? So let's get to it. Let's get to your questions. So here's a question I got, actually, from a Flower Math student recently. Because when you do sign up for Flower Math, I am here to support the course. So like, if you have questions, after you take the course, while you're in the middle of something, you shoot me an email and I get back to you. <laughs> so I'm here to answer your questions. Um, so here's a question that I got. I am a subscriber of your Flower Math program. My question is, when I have a client who is ordering only three to five arrangements, like vases, centerpieces, how do I still ensure a 70% profit margin when I'm required to purchase from my wholesaler in bunches? Um, for example, 25 stems of roses. Do I charge for the entire bunch or just the stems used? Thank you for your prompt reply. So here's what I wrote back. Um, I said, this is a great question, because <laughs> it really is. Um, and basically what I found when I was doing weekly orders is that I had to charge for every single stem that I bought. So whether I used it or not, I had to charge for the entire bunch. So here's how I broke it down for her. So for example, um, I'd make sure that I covered all of those roses by either doing a higher markup, like a four times markup instead of a three times, for example, or by dividing the bunch price, the 25 stem bunch, by 19 stems instead of by 25 stems. So for example, if I paid $32 for the bunch for 25 stems, I'd divide it by 19 stems, and that's $1.68 per stem, times the three times markup equals $4, excuse me, $5 per stem. So that's how I would personally approach this in my own business. I don't buy inventory, I don't keep inventory, like that's just not my business model. Um, if you have a flower shop, obviously you can add overage into your inventory and sell it, right? So it just becomes part of your inventory. But I always charge for every stem that I buy. So that's just, that's the way you do it. So, you know, sometimes you buy 25 roses, but you can't necessarily get all 25 out of that bunch, right? So should you be pricing your stems not on the per stem price, but on what it costs you for the 23 perfect roses you got or the 24 or whatever you ended up with? So that's the way I like to think of it. Um, and when it comes to like, how do you make sure you make that 70% profit margin when you're doing smaller orders? 
there's not an easy answer to that other than this, which is you have to have a minimum. Like you have to know what the minimum is someone has to spend in order for you to make your margin. So if someone wants to place a $35 order, that's probably not enough for you to make back your, to, to make your margin. But if they place, you know, a $150 order, well, that's different, right? So it's just going to depend, even if, for example, they want three $50 arrangements, right? Like you can make three $50 arrangements more profitable than one $50 arrangement. So it's just gonna come down to that sort of balancing act of figuring out for yourself, where do you make money and where do you lose money? Um, and, you know, what I did when I had weekly accounts in order to make it as profitable as possible is I had like my standing accounts and then that those were the days where I did any other deliveries. So if you wanted a delivery to so-and-so, if there was some special occasion, and I was really clear about this on my website, like the day I deliver is on Thursday. So that is the day when you can get your delivery. And that ensured that, you know, it's not like then on Friday, I got an order for something that I wasn't prepared for, or I was holding flowers until a Tuesday. Like everything was fresh. Everything was on Thursday. Like that's the way I did it. I see some more people tuning in. Hey, good morning, you guys. Good morning, good morning. Um, and if you have a pricing question, enter it in the comments and hopefully I'll see it and answer it for you. Thanks again for tuning in today for my price talk. Price talk with Alice and Alice. Okay, here's a good one that I got. Simple enough. How do you determine pricing for boutonnieres and corsages? So this is a little more of a choose your own adventure when it comes to pricing, right? There's this formula that florists use for applying markups, for applying a design fee, right? And then there are areas where we're a little more choose your own adventure. Corsages and boutonnieres are one of those things. You don't necessarily do a three times markup and then a 35% design fee on a boutonniere. The boutonniere takes a certain amount of time and care, TLC, you're gonna wrap it, you're gonna store it in a special place, you're gonna deliver it in a special way. When you're packing up the car, you gotta put that boutonniere in a special place. So there's always, there's a little more care that goes into that boutonniere and corsage situation, right? <laughs> so you can choose your own adventure. I have seen prices on boutonnieres that blow my mind. I have seen people who charge $35 for a boutonniere. I have seen people who charge $75 for a corsage. God bless you, good for you. If you can get that, do it. Um, I tend to charge what I feel like is more like the average price for a boutonniere, which is about $15. So some people charge less, like 12. Some people charge more, like 18. So this is where you choose your own adventure. If it's something like a Cala, I would charge more. If it's something like orchids, I would charge more. If it's something that requires lots of wiring, I might charge more, right? So you have to consider what goes into what you're making when you're setting that fee. And then same thing for corsages, right? Like it's not just about how big it is, it's about how intricate it is, it's about what type of flowers you use. Um, I was just name dropping, name dropping alert. I was just having dinner with Passion Flower Sue last night. She was doing a presentation at my local wholesaler. And so she was saying how, you know, people always ask her about pricing. And she says, you have to do the math yourself, right? So if you want to do one of Sue's like amazing floral tattoos, does that have to be $50 or should that be $200, right? It's up to you based on the time you're putting into it, the skill you're putting into it. And something I really like to throw out there, especially for people who are actively consuming like workshops and tutorials and things, if you've paid to learn information, right, you have now learned it, absorbed it, it's now part of your toolbox, like you charge for that information. It's not just something that, you know, gets folded into your day rate, right? Like you invested and so you can raise a price because you now have a new skill, right, that allows you to do even better work. And again, as much as I talk about pricing, right, get what you're worth, blah -de blah like I want you to be profitable. At the end of the day, I also want you to provide value to your client, right? Because we don't want the client being like, wow, that florist is very profitable, but boy, I feel really ripped off, right? 
No bueno. We can't run our business like that. So we want the client to experience the value that we provide and also get paid for our time. Uh, Tracy tuned in. She said, it's perceived value. Totally true. So that's why it falls under this, you know, choose your own adventure category. If it took you time and it took you extra effort and you're rolling a little corsage bag and you're, you know, whatever you're doing, putting labels, right? Every little step of that is what goes into that $15 or the $18 or $25 or $35, whatever you want to charge for your boutonnieres because it's your, it's your, your adventure. So you choose how it goes. Um, and if you have more questions on that, you guys feel free, but Tracy said it perfectly. It's that perceived value. It's the time, right? They can't make that. <laughs> they can't make that boot near last all day like you can. All right, here's the next question. Ideally, what percentage of the wedding budget should go to flowers after the 30 to 40% design fee? And how do you figure that out? All right, so this is a good question, but it's not super easy to answer, and I'll tell you why. Because everyone sort of prices in, when you price within the industry standard, you're following either a three to four times markup on your flowers. You're doing, like you said here in your question, 30 to 40% design fee. So those small differences, right, make a big difference in how much you're going to spend. So this is why I actually, what I teach in flower math is that I don't go in with a spending goal. <laughs> I don't have an amount of money that like, I have to spend this much. Like I owe this much product in dollars to this client. I do everything based on recipes and pricing things out based on the stem count. So I like to keep my wholesale orders tight and right. And by doing that, I maximize my profit because I'm not ordering, for example, 23 extra roses because I could have like done some juggling around and not ordered that bunch of roses and ordered one bunch of something else, right? I am keeping track of what I need. And so I buy based on what I need. And then if I make my 70% profit margin or my 75% or my 78%, which happens sometimes, right? That's because of my ordering. It's not because I went in with a spending goal that allowed me to make 70%. If you go in with a spending goal that allows you to make 70%, that's okay, maybe, but you could be making more <laughs> if you don't have a spending goal so much. You can have a cap in your mind, like, I'm not going to exceed this. But really, I highly encourage florists to do your recipes and orders and do the math. It's super easy math. It's really easy. Just do the math so that you know for yourself, like, what percentage of this order is going to the design fee? And what percentage of this order is going to flowers? And what percentage is going to, to my supplies? So that you know at the end of the day, I made my 70%, I made my 73, I made my 80, whatever percentage you're gonna make on that wedding, you have a really clear understanding of why and where you made it, okay? So I hope that that makes sense. Um, and I can understand that's not like, totally answering your question of like how much should you do it's because i don't do the math that way right so you can easily a lot of people will say well you take your 30 to 40 percent off the top and then divide by three and then that gives you your number right maybe <laughs> or maybe you could be doing you could be making even more money simply by following recipes instead of having like this spending goal in mind so that's really what it's about. It's about keeping your wholesale order tight and right. I say this all the time because it's just so true. It doesn't matter what you charge if you overbuy, right? So you can charge the three or four times markup. You can charge the 30 to 40% design fee. But if you're overbuying, you're going to lose every time, right? So let's see. All right, here's another one, right? Um, let me see. Am I missing any questions in your comments here? Okay, good. We got some more. How do you determine the amount of flowers to put in a bridal bouquet? Okay, so that just what I just said. I always do recipes. So I do my math. I see how much money I have to spend. And then I work out, like, how many roses can I do at that price? How many whatever else is in the bouquet? How many dahlias? How much do I have to spend on eucalyptus? Like, whatever goes into it, I do the math that way. And I, I show you exactly how I do that in flower math, like 
step by step on five different weddings. So you'll see like five bridal bouquets. You'll see five different sets of bridesmaids bouquets. Like you see the whole wedding broken down. So you can see not only just you could take the recipes and use them, <laughs> but you can see like why and how and how I figure it all out. Okay, so uh, here's a good one. How to set a, a minimum for brides when you're a new florist is the question. So how do you set a minimum budget when you're new? Another really great question. It's not always easy, and the truth is maybe you can't yet, okay? <laughs> that is the truth. I did not start my business with a minimum. Um, I also explain this in Flower Math, but I always had like starting prices, and I share all my starting prices with you in Flower Math too. Um, like over the last 16 years, like how much I've charged, when the prices went up. So I've always had a basic starting price for things. So I know how much I'm going to start my bridal bouquet at, and I know how much I'm going to start my centerpieces at. And so even if I didn't declare like you have to spend $5,000 or you have to spend $2,000, when I was writing the quote, I knew in my mind that I wasn't going to be falling below this minimum. <laughs> and so I'm going to just quote it and like, this is the price, but there's not really wiggle room here, you know? And I would tell them that I would say like, this is the very best price I can give you for this. What I do now and what I wish I had done all along, but what I think is just a really good key piece to having a minimum is every wedding gets a minimum and we make sure we communicate that to the customer right on their proposal, right on the quote. You can put it in the contract, but that's not good enough. I want it right in front of them on the quote so that when they're reading, like, if you'd like to move forward, you'll do this. Oh, and by the way, here's that minimum you're going to spend. There's just no question. There's no haggling. They understand that for their event, this is the minimum. It's not a random minimum that I'm picking just because I'm picking it. <laughs> it's a minimum for their, for what they want. So that's a huge tip, I think, in terms, especially starting out. If you can have some starting prices for things, give people a quote, and then define for them what their minimum would be with your company for what they want, that's how I would start to establish the minimum. And then just to get a little bit more detailed on it, to, to truly set a minimum, what I do is I look at real numbers. <laughs> that is, I think people sometimes really don't like when I use that as an answer, but I use it all the time. Look at the real numbers. That is how I decide. So I will see what is my average wedding this year? What was my average wedding last year, right? Um, then I'll look at to see like, what number occurred the most, right? So I might have an average of 3,400 one year, but maybe the average that people spent was 3,200, right? Or maybe the average that they spent was 2,900, but I had one big one that throws the whole thing off. So I like to really look at like what's actually happening in my business <laughs> and then use that. So if you have a good year and you have, minimums, let's just say your average wedding is $2,000 and that's what people spent, you should feel confident putting a $2,000 minimum on your website if you want to put it on your website or simply verbally communicate that to, who, to whoever's inquiring. We have a $2,000 minimum and it's not a number we picked out of the sky. <laughs> it's based on the work that we do. And then you reevaluate that minimum. That minimum may have to go up next year. It may go down one year, okay? I, I see that with florists. There are florists who have like had a $5,000 minimum like strong on their site for years and all of a sudden that minimum's gone. <laughs> They're not telling you that anymore. You gotta pay attention to what's going on in your industry, right? To know when it's time to pivot, when it's time to raise the minimum, when it's time to remove the minimum. Um, when it's time to implement the minimum, but you're smart, even if you're just starting out to be thinking about how do I do this? Okay. So I appreciate that question. Um, I just see a couple of things coming in here. Sarah says, hopefully I can watch this later after 3 PM in the UK doing a school pickup. All right. Well, pick up those kids. Enjoy your afternoon. Um, all right. Janelle says, 
For event florals, like weddings, should you post your pricing or minimum investment on your site? I've been in business for years, but still flip back and forth with this. You know, I actually have a whole post just about this. Um, it's called, should you put a price list on your website? <laughs> Should you list your pricing on your website? Um, so I have some place where I have an answer to that, but the short answer is it depends. <laughs> it just depends on your market, how your customers prefer to shop. Is that going to entice them and make them more inclined to click and buy with you? Or is it not really servicing them and giving them information that they need? So it depends on who you are and uh, who your clients are. That's, but there's, I have, I'll share you a link. It's called like something like, should you have a price list on your website? <laughs> I'll put the whole post for you on that. Um, okay, here's another one. Um, how many weddings should I do in order to be able to support myself? Doing the numbers with your floral math course, question. Um, salary, health insurance, rent for the home, rent for the shop, utilities, vehicles, etc. So, this is again where you're going to do the real numbers. Um, I also have a video on this called How Much Does a Florist Make? where I give you some tips on really how you want to figure this out. Like you want to figure out for yourself how much money do you need to make, how much money do you want to make, and then you can figure it out from there. So for example, if you're doing $2,000 weddings, right, and you want to make $50,000 in sales, right, how many $2,000 weddings do you have to do? And if you want to do, if you're doing $5,000 weddings and you want to make $100,000 in sales, how many do you have to do? So you can figure for yourself, you know, like, is this feasible? Do I need to keep my day job? <laughs> That's what I would always do. I would figure out how many weddings did I book? It was a, it's a slow climb sometimes when you're in business. And I also say this all the time, but it's true. There's no guarantee that this year's great season leads to next year's great season, right? So that's why we always want to be on our toes, maximizing our profit as much as we can, but also being realistic about like how much we can expect this business to make for us, right? Because um, flourishing is not a get rich quick scheme. So that's why we have to really be realistic. So figure out, you know, what are all your expenses? What do you need to make so that you can like, so you might make a 70% profit margin on flowers and supplies following the flower math formulas, right? But then you have additional expenses that come out of that. So if you need to make, if you're trying to make $50,000 worth of sales, but really only 25,000 of that is going to be cash, right? <laughs> that you still have at the end of the year. Um, is that enough money, right? Like how many, how are you gonna make that work? Um, if you're only keeping 50% of your total sales or 40% or 10%, right? You gotta, you gotta look at the numbers because that's where the truth lies. And don't be afraid of your numbers. I, I think that that is something that flowers struggle with. They get afraid. They're, they don't want to find out how much money they've been leaving on the table, right? Or they don't want to find out how low their sales really are this year. Look at the numbers. You cannot improve what you do not measure, right? So measure how much money you're making on each order. Measure how many weddings you have now versus how many weddings you had this time last year. Measure what that average sale is. These are such easy things to do, by the way, too. So easy, okay? Like, you don't have to be afraid of the numbers in this business because it is easy to keep on top of them. Um, it really, really can be easy, okay? I am not like a mathematician. <laughs> I just know flower math. I just know how to make money in my business. Um, so, all right, here's another one. I have no staff. Join the club. How many people have no staff? Raise your hand. Um, I have no staff. Should I put myself on a payroll? How do you pay yourself? Currently, I don't pay myself, she says. Um, I rely on the side job for that and only transfer money from my business account to myself when I need to. Okay, I can so relate to that. <laughs> I definitely ran my business like that for a really long time. Um, so I'll tell you how I do it now. I'm an S corporation now, and so I have a payroll service that pays me, <laughs> which 
the cheap, cheap, cheap person inside of me that doesn't like to pay anybody to do anything I could do myself. It's like, why am I paying somebody to write me a check? But they're taking care of all kinds of stuff, right? They're paying taxes, they're taking care of everything that needs to be taken care of so that I don't have to. And so it's saving me time and at the end of the year, saving me money also to have this done. So I checked in with my accountant and that's what you should do too. Even, again, my super cheap inner self right? <laughs> don't, didn't want to spend any money on my business when I was starting out. There was nothing that I would buy that wasn't absolutely necessary, but I always paid for an accountant. Um, you know, it used to be like 150 bucks for him to do my taxes. Uh, it's much more than that now with my new accountant. But find a professional who can do your taxes, who can advise you on what's the best, because you want, this is a decision that you want to make based on like, taxation. <laughs> you want to make it in a way so that you are, you know, getting as much money as you can without like get, jumping into the, the next tax bracket and all that kind of good stuff. So that's the, the best advice I can give you is get a professional to advise you on your particular situation and your particular income level um, so that you can decide. For a really long time, I was just a sole proprietor and, you know, it was just kind of loosey-goosey. Again, like I would just take money when I really needed it, but it didn't feel like I didn't feel like it was my money from the business. It was always like in in that little account. Um, and then finally, I started paying myself officially, right? So it, and it feels really good. It feels really stable to just be like that paycheck is happening. This is this is like something automatic going on in my world <laughs> that I don't have to worry about. Um, and you know, I check in at the end of the year with my accountant to make sure like everything's on track. Um, oh, Allison's here. Hey, Allison. Okay. Angela says, I think explaining to the customer why you have a minimum sometimes helps for the sake of transparency and trust. So they know where you're coming from. Can't do business if you can't make money on these weddings. Totally true. Like, you know, you don't have to over explain, but just saying, hey, you know, this is what it takes for me to deliver the quality of work that you see here on my website or that I am proud to deliver to you or that you're expecting based on your Pinterest board, right? Like that's why it costs this. If you want to get that, this is where it starts. And we shouldn't be too guarded to explain a little bit about our pricing to people because Transparency is sexy. It just is. Okay. Me drinking out of this orange straw, not so sexy, but transparency totally is. Okay. Here's a real good one that came through this morning. Uh, this is from one of my Argo business peeps. Okay. So she says, hi, Allison. I have a pricing question for you. I'm charging a three times markup and a 30% design fee for weddings with an additional hourly rate for delivery and setup. Perfect. So then she says she's in the uh, Baltimore, D.C. metro area. And despite charging correctly, she's still hearing on occasion that her prices are lower than other florists. For example, she says, quoting $5,000 and hearing that another florist quoted $6,500, for example. So that's what happened with two different Baltimore weddings. Um, so she's saying, it's just kind of making me wonder. I feel like my prices are correct and fair but I worry I'm still somehow undercutting others because this market is generally higher than others. Um, or that they know something I don't, she said. <laughs> and I mean, I also get feedback that I'm charging more than other florists in my area, so who knows? I guess my greater question is, is there such thing as a local industry standard in which I would need to charge more in order to not undercut my market? So, super brilliant question. It's a good observation and also like major kudos for being tuned into like people are saying this, but they're also saying this. So like, where do I fall? Right. You don't have to be the most expensive and you don't have to be the least expensive to be a great florist. Right. So and to be chosen. So for you to be someone who's sometimes hearing you're lower and sometimes hearing you're higher, I think that's OK. <laughs> I really do. I think it's fine. And I think it's super smart to be tuned into it though. So yeah, in an area like New York, in your, you know, this Baltimore DC metro area, if this is a place where people are spending more money on weddings, where your customers, where the market can bear that sort of like 
well, they want something bigger, so I'm charging more, right? There's got to be a reason why you charge more. I've had people sometimes tell me, oh, you should charge more for delivery or something. Like, I don't need to. <laughs> I'm making plenty of money off this thing. So you have to know for yourself, like, when you need more money. So if I were going to charge more money, I would charge more money on, like, the centerpieces. So to me, this is just, like, my little prediction thing would be if it's a $1,500 difference, it's probably just a couple of things like the centerpieces. It's possible that you've got, you know, 10 centerpieces or 12 centerpieces that they're charging, let's just say $75 more for or something like that. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be this bigger jump in the difference between your quotes. Um, so they may be asking for $200 a centerpiece. Or, you know, you could be asking for $125, which is nice to ask for a centerpiece, but they're asking $200, and so there's a discrepancy. So I think as long as you're not promising a $200 centerpiece for $125, you're not undercutting anybody. You're providing your best competitive price, and if you feel good about it, then I would just, I would keep moving forward. But I would also keep in my mind, like, hmm, some people are willing to pay $1,500 more on certain things, so maybe I'm going to up my ceremony arrangements by 75 bucks a piece. Maybe I'm going to up my bridesmaids bouquets by $5, right? Like, little increments, and that's something I show you in Flower Math with, like, my starting prices. Little increments are how we grow our business and slowly get to, you know, that place where we're the $6,500 florist now. And it's important to, I think it's, it's courteous of you, frankly, to even care if you're possibly undercutting somebody, especially when you know that you are more expensive than others. Like, it's just, it's good to be aware. It's good to be aware of that. All right, so Caroline said, thank you for everything you do. And she had a couple of questions. She had three questions. One is how to price for rentals how to price for delivery, install, and cleanup, and do some people charge a consultation fee? So the first two questions, how to price for rentals and how to price for delivery, I have um, some excellent blog posts on that for you with videos already, so I'll share links to those as well. Um, how to price for rentals and how to charge for delivery are um, also choose your own adventure to some degree. There's some industry standard around it, and then you can kind of implement for yourself. So I have answered those previously and I'll share some links. But do some people charge a consultation fee? That's a really good one. Um, if you charge a consultation fee, feel free to leave a comment here. Um, you know, I have known of a local florist here in Vermont who charged, I think it was like a $75 uh, consultation fee years ago. I don't know if she still does it. I would imagine she does. And I was like, wow. She's amazing. <laughs> I really was. I was like, that is, that is it. That is the coolest. She is not wasting her time. She is not messing around. She is like, I, I charge $75. Years later, <laughs> as I have really worked hard on my business messaging, my own personal branding, like what do I do? What are my core values? What are the principles of my business, right? Charging for a consultation is not in line with that, like, transparency is sexy <laughs> kind of mantra that I try to live by because for a couple of reasons, but here's the main reason. If somebody pays me $75 to sit down and talk about their wedding, it implies that I'm willing to work with them right now. It means if I'm willing to take your money right now, I'm willing to do your wedding. And that's just not true for me. I need to talk to them. I need to have a meeting of the minds on what the minimum is. I want to make sure that they're not asking me for something that I think is unreasonable. I want to make sure that they don't expect, you know, a $5,000 wedding for $2,500. And I want to make sure that they treat me, like, with respect, <laughs> that they follow my rules. And if they don't, then I'm not going to work with them, right? So if I take their $75, or $150, or whatever you would charge for your consultation fee, because your time is valuable, it's, it's communicating something that's not true for me, because I am not going to just book your wedding because you gave me $75 and we sat down. So even if that consultation fee gets applied towards the balance of the wedding, which a lot of people do, 
Um, and some people probably don't. <laughs> but you know, that, again, this is something you have to choose for yourself. Do you have so many people asking for consultations that you have to charge to weed people out? Is there some other way that you can pre-qualify clients so they don't have to actually pay you to get information from you, but you can get information from them that helps set that tone, that authority, right? That says, hey, here's, here's how we're gonna proceed from here. <laughs> here's how this works, right? Here's my minimum. First, we have a phone consultation. Whatever it is that you define the rules so that you can you know, take control of the situation. So I don't want to charge. I'll charge for consultation fees if it's like an unnecessary consultation. For example, like if somebody's booked with me already and they're going to want a site visit that's far away, I'll probably charge for that. If they're going to want a site visit at a place that's close by but I do not need to visit, I will probably charge for that. So, you know, it just depends again on like the circumstances and you set your own rules. And again, you set rules and then you change them, right? So you can try, you can try it out. We have a hundred dollar consultation fee. You'll get a proposal and uh, that gets applied to your deposit or whatever, or whatever your rules are. So if you're going to do it though, you got to have clear defined situation of like how it works. Um, and what you're doing. Okay, so Ashley says, I charge a small fee to weed out people who aren't serious, and I will say it works a ton. Awesome, that's great. Uh, she also goes on to say, it's credited to their order once they book, uh, which I think is the right thing to do. <laughs> um, it just covers our time and sending an estimate online along with a mood board. So, perfect. So, we should value that time, right? Because <laughs> flower math, you know, I teach you how to price your flowers, how to price your design time, but you also have to keep in mind, right, any other time you're spending in your business. So it's not just about the time that you are uh, actually designing, you're spending time on, on booking that client, right? So that, that's the time that gets covered too. Um, I missed a question up here higher. Okay, Chrissy says, does a delivery and setup fee fluctuate based on the total sale? Should this be a percentage of the sale or a flat rate? Okay, so again, I answered this in another uh, broadcast, but I'll give you a quick reply on that. It depends. <laughs> it's a little bit of choose your own adventure. Some people swear by doing the percentage. I personally like to charge for my time instead because it's not always the same. Like sometimes it might be higher than the percentage would be because of the distance. Sometimes it's just down the street and I don't need to charge a percentage to just go 15 minutes away to a venue that's like the closest venue to me, right? So it's a it's based on, again, I like to make it based on real numbers. So do you need 10 or 20% to leave your door? Do you need $500? Do you need $1,000? Like, what is it? You know, how many people are you paying? Um, coming up with real numbers is always super helpful. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. What else do I have here? Oh, I've got some questions here. Mandy, hi Mandy. She says, would you include that in your contract? The site visits, extra meetings, et cetera, are an extra charge. Yeah, I would. Um, and here's the thing, you know, it's always good to include things in your contract, but it's better to put them right in front of the client. So things that make me, things that make me go, hmm, <laughs> when Floris will say something like, well, it says it right on my website. Okay, but did you say it specifically to the client, right? Like, we can't enforce rules that we did not present, right? So I would just say make sure you're presenting this to the client. So it can be in the contract. Like, I do have some stuff on site visits in my contract. But what I really like to do is say, okay, so each, I do everything individual. You know this by, by now about me. Um, I like to do everything customized. So there's a specific venue by me where they do a site visit with the whole crew week before the wedding, two weeks, sometime, you know, it depends, right? But it's a time sucker, <laughs> huge time sucker. I usually don't need to be there, but at the end of the day, if I'm being honest, I'm glad I am, right? <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm glad I went, but it could easily take three, four hours out of my day. So I know when I'm booking that client, that that meeting is gonna happen. So I don't need to say anything to the client about it. I just like make sure my delivery fee is bigger for those events. And I know in my mind that that includes a site visit. 
Sometimes I'll also write the site visit. I'll write, you know, we're going we're gonna to do a site visit and I'll put the price. Sometimes I'll write the, the site visit and I'll put a zero dollar price there because I want them to see how generous I am <laughs> that I'm doing the site visit for free and you know it's for free because I'm listing it here. And then if it turns out that like they need a second site visit or something like that, I can easily say, this is how much it is per hour. It's 150 an hour or it's 250 with the travel time, whatever it is, and just like present it really clearly. And when we're clear and just precise about it, again, transparent about it, they accept it. They're like, okay. And a lot of times they'll say, oh no, we don't need that meeting, right? <laughs> But we also can't blame clients who just want to like get as much as they can, right? If, if they ask you for a meeting, you say yes. You can't blame them that they're asking for the meeting. You said yes, right? You can always say no or put a price tag on it right then, you know, right when they ask. Yes, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to meet you. It's $150. If you'd like to do that, we can schedule it. Let me know by Friday and I'll put you on my calendar, right? So it can be, you know, like a little uh, zippy. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, an officially like, initial here thing. Uh, let's see. Victoria said, same here on the consultation fee. I give them the first 30 minutes of my time free. Oh, I like that. Anytime after that, providing we are in fact working together is charged for. Great. I love it. I think the follow-up meetings are, are more of a problem than the initial consultation. You know, like that's the thing you really want to define the, the time and the cost and the things for. Um, but you can do whatever makes sense for you because you want to value your time. You know, when I started out, I did not fully, I was not able to get the value for my time, right? It took a little practice to do that. Um, all right, I got one more question here that I wanted to answer. How much money is added in for time? <laughs> it's almost as if I knew that was the last question. Um, so she says, I haven't been factoring in my time until recently. So kudos for factoring it in now. Um, she said, I started paying myself $10 an hour until I saw a sign at McDonald's saying they're hiring for $11.25. So that struck me because I totally get that, okay? Like when I started in the floral industry, I was 16, I was, a, I was just a wee babe. <laughs> and I was making like $5 an hour, right? So we all start somewhere <laughs> and you know, after getting that, the floral bug at 16, right? Like I kind of knew I wanted to have a floral business. I wanted to open a shop, but I didn't really know how I would make that happen financially. And in time, you know, after working at a bunch of different shops, I was finally at like $18 an hour working part-time for somebody and running my business on the side until it was just time to just push through. You know, it wasn't easy. It was not easy to have a second job <laughs> and to run my business. But in time, you know, when you talk about finally paying yourself for your time, um, and there was another question earlier, like I'm not paying myself, like you should always pay yourself. It is the first rule of business is pay yourself first. So, I mean, you could even just Google, what's the first rule of business? And I would not be surprised if <laughs> pay yourself first comes up, okay? so. It is so, it is that important, you know, like it, it just from my bottom of my heart to you, like that is why I made Flower Math because it is that important. You need to be paying yourself. So, you know, I went from starting at $5 an hour to like finally being up at like 18 or something to I probably don't make less than $50 an hour on most events and sometimes it's more than that, right? So you should have your own fee of like, what you think you're worth per hour, um, what is your time worth, and then set your fees accordingly, you know, because you really are worth it. Um, you know, I really wanted to build my dream business, but it didn't seem like it was gonna happen, you know, <laughs> it really was like, I'm just gonna have to work doing ski school in the winters and farming in the summer and then coming home and designing weddings, like that was what I was doing, and I wasn't, particularly unhappy, frankly, <laughs> you know, it was hard work and it was a hustle. But, you know, again, when you can buckle down and focus in on the fact that you need to earn your income and where's your money coming in and how do you set your minimums and how do you keep incrementally growing, you know, that's when then the pieces can start to fall together. And that's, 
you know, that's how I feel it was for me. It's this organic growth, but always following the flower math formula so that I'm always making money. You know, like that truly is what it's about. And I tell you this like personal money story because like I do, I get it and I want to illustrate that for you. Like I just want you to know like I didn't have like, I didn't take out a loan. <laughs> I didn't have some like big, investment, some big leap I took. It was very conservative starting of a business. Very minor, you know, like I'm just going to do a few things while I work and I'm going to take a few weddings while I have another job. Um, but you know, if I didn't keep my wholesale orders tight and right, if I didn't know how to do these things, if I didn't finally invest in myself, right, to get a cooler, to invest money back into the business, right? Like I hate spending money on my business. <laughs> I know this about myself and I know this about, you know, floralpreneurs in general. We, we want to, we, we just don't want to get ahead of ourselves. You know, I didn't want to get out too far ahead of my skis where I'm like super invested in this business and then it doesn't work. Right. Cause it's can be scary. Um, but you can't be afraid to buy things for your business. You can't be afraid to invest in your education. You can't be afraid to invest in, yourself and at one point if you want this to be your full-time job you can't be afraid to take that leap you know because it is what it's going to take like I had to figure out how I was going to save money so that I could make more money so that I could spend wisely right like this is this is a cycle <laughs> and it goes on and on it's not like oh I had a good year in business and so now I will just continue to it's like and how do I keep this wheel going? How do I keep the income and the cash flow flowing through my business year after year? And it just, it takes practice. But I have a business that I love, right? And more than that, like, the idea is to have a life that you enjoy, right? Like, having a life. A lot of florists would have to admit that they don't have much of a life sometimes, right? Especially during wedding season. Um, and that's the truth. Like we, we work hard and it's okay. It's okay. But we got to make some money too. And you want to have a business you're proud of. And I'm in going into my 18th season in business, right? So I have this positive feeling money story for my business now, right? And I've, I have for years. Um, once I finally was able to realize that I could quit that part-time job and dive into this full-time maximizing my profit, tracking my profit was what it's all about. And you can do this too. You can have a business you're proud of, you can be profitable, whether it's your full-time job, your part-time job, and again, whether you're working out of your garage, your studio, wherever, right? It doesn't matter where you're working. You can have a business that earns money and feels good. So if you need help with your pricing, Flower Math is on sale right now. It is my March Madness St. Patrick's Day sale, okay? It ends on Sunday. So if you sign up today, you will get a special bonus of my business plan jumpstart. The course is $449. So it is an investment in your business. You can do a one payment or two payment plan. No interest on the one or two payment. Well, obviously not on the one payment, but no interest on the two payment plan either. If you need this course, I want to make it accessible to you so that you can get the information you need. Because again, you can have this business that you're proud of. You can't think of it like a get rich quick scheme, right? But you can make money on every single order. And Flower Math is the only program you will need to teach you how to do this. Like you will know how to make a profit on every single thing that you buy, every service that you do from now on in your business. So again, Kelly said, when she, she said just last week, I loved Allison's Flower Math course and learned so much and put it into practice immediately. I saw an increased profit margin on my very first event following the course, and I'm feeling more confident with each event. So that is what it is about. It's about confidence and making more money. <laughs> Those things can go hand in hand. And uh, I teach you exactly how to do it in Flower Math. It's just $449 from right now until Sunday at 5 p.m. I'm only offering this to like 50 florists. So this is a special price. I'm doing this like fast action. <laughs> if you want to get it, you got to be one of the 50. Um, and I don't put this on sale often. It was on sale in November. Um, and it, I don't have the next sale on this plan. So <laughs> this is the time. If you don't want to miss out on the bonus, sign up today. 
if you want to make more money in your business immediately, right? Flower Knot is the answer for you. So you can find everything right on my website at realflowerbusiness.com. I have a special tab that says Flower Math Sale, and I'll share the details, a link to click over and buy, and you can get started right now. So it's, it's there for you. It's a tool I made, uh, not just because I thought, hey, you know, flowers could buy something from me. <laughs> it's really something that I made so that you can make money. And florists tell me all the time that they make back the cost of the course in one wedding. So if you have one wedding booked, if you have two weddings booked, if you have five weddings booked, you're gonna make back the cost of the course, what you invest in your education, you're gonna make back on your next wedding. Um, and I also have a money back guarantee on the course, okay? So if you sign up, if you're feeling it's risky, right? I'm risk averse, I get it. <laughs> I don't like to do things that are risky. There's a money back guarantee. So I want you to not just sign up for the course, I want you to love the course, okay? So if you don't love it, you get in touch with me and we'll have a conversation about it, okay? But uh, that's, that's why I made the money back guarantee, because I really do stand behind it. Because transparency is sexy, right? So <laughs> that's what it's all about. Um, let me see if I missed any more questions. Victoria says, I am indeed a money hoarder. We all are, we all are. Um, seriously, if you don't already have her flower math course, get it. It's worth every penny. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, Tasha says, so worth it. Highly recommend. Thank you so much. I so appreciate that. Um, oh, and Lindsay says, so worth it. The mental clarity and confidence alone is a game changer. You guys, I so appreciate you tuning in. I love when there's like actual flower math people here. I so appreciate you tuning in. Um, or watching on a replay. So <laughs> thanks so much for tuning in. Keep doing beautiful work, you guys. If you have more pricing questions for me, I could not get to all the questions that got submitted. Um, so we'll have to do this again, okay? <laughs> thanks for tuning in for Price Talk with Alice and Ellis. Again, if you have questions for me, feel free to leave a comment and head on over and take advantage of this sale price today so that you get the bonus before 9 p.m. tonight, okay? Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.